Okay, YouTubers and anti-nuke activists, I'm testing a new microphone, so I hope this audio comes through nice and clear and crisp. And we're returning to the NRC Freedom of Information Act documents pertaining to Fukushima. I just want to do a quick four screen captures to show you that we are not prepared over here for neither tsunamis nor earthquakes to the degree that we would feel should feel comfortable and feel safe. So let's look at the first uh, screen capture. This is one from Gary Holohan. I've showed this before, March 18. And this was in reference to, I'll read the bottom one first because they're discussing the president has directed us to conduct a comprehensive review of the safety of the domestic fleet. And then when we refer to fleet, they're talking about the fleet of nuclear reactors. It's not ships out on the ocean. They refer to them as a fleet of domestic nuclear uh, reactors. Now, the particular email in question uh, Gary Holohan is emailing Marty Virgilio, and he says to Marty, I think this is right on target, referring to this, to the presence directing them to do this a comprehensive review. I think this is right on target. In addition, for the long-term look, we will likely need to revisit the issue of non-seismically qualified spent fuel pools, of which I recall there are many. I alerted Eric to the non-seismic spent fuel pool fact yesterday. So there's your bit of evidence right there from NRC themselves that we have non-seismically qualified spent fuel pools, and this guy says there's many of them. So uh, that's worrisome for me and should be for you as well. Next screen capture from Brian Sharon, sent to Kevin Coiney. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in regards to seismic and tsunami hazard. And he says, and so the first question is, quote, should we make licensees consider a tsunami coincident with a seismic event that triggers the tsunami, end quote. The second question is, how should we consider aftershocks in seismic hazard analysis? So this is a bit of admission right here that they're, when they build these plants, they don't take into consideration there could be an earthquake and a tsunami that follows the earthquake, or at least that's what I'm comprehending out of this particular section. And the next screen capture is going to kind of back that up, where Brian Sharon is uh, mailing a couple people, including Kevin Coiney, Michael Case, Jennifer Uhl, and this is in regards to seismic and tsunami hazard. He says, the question is, did the Japanese also consider an 8.9 magnitude earthquake and resulting tsunami, quote unquote, way too low a probability for consideration? And he says, look at GI-99. That's a manual on earthquakes and, and how it relates to the power plants. It shows we didn't know everything about the seismicity of the continental eastern U.S., and isn't there a prediction that uh, the West Coast is likely to get hit with some huge earthquake in the next 30 years or so? Yet we relicense their plant. So two admissions here. Number one, he's saying, are the Japanese like us, that they don't consider an 8.9 earthquake and a tsunami a poss possibility? And the bottom section, he says, look, it shows we didn't know everything about the seismicity of the continental eastern U.S. So, you know, and again, a prediction of a big one on the West Coast. This is extremely worrisome right here. And, and inside these NRC for you documents, this is the insight you get into in their own words. Okay, again, we're using their own words against them because what the establishment mouthpieces and propaganda outlets will tell us is something totally different than inside these documents. We get an insight into the reality in their own admission, in their own words. That's what's so important about these NRC for you documents, besides the fact it reveals the world's largest provable mini multi-agency reveals so much it's incredible it is the silver bullet the biggest cover up that we have seen yet on this planet okay and the last one let's have a look at says from brian sharon uh, to annie Kammerer, uh, subject question i'm seeing a spectrum of tsunami wave heights that reportedly hit the fukushima plant I saw in one of your briefing packages that was a usgs calculation that showed the peak wave height at about 30 feet I saw some slides from TEPCO yesterday that said the tsunami wave height at the plant was, quote, more than 10 meters, end quote. In today's Nucleonics Week, on page 11, it says, quote, TEPCO discovered by checking the walls of Fukushima 1 and the nearby Fukushima 2, March 21st, that the tsunamis had reached higher than 14 meters, about 46 feet, above sea level. It then said the design basis for Fukushima 1 and 2 was 5.7 and 5.2 meters respectively. Without any accurate measurements, are we limited to educated guesses and expert judgment? I think one question we will, we will be asked is how well we can predict a tsunami wave height. 
Okay, and the important, it goes on a couple more things there, but the important thing I want to show you here is this admission uh, that TEPCO measured between one and two and got about 46 feet uh, height of the water level on those particular reactor buildings. So I dug around and looked into San Onofre, and they have a 30-foot, from what I read, a 30-foot protective barrier. So at 46 feet, it would have swept over the walls of San Onofre, according to my research. In any case, and I'll try to include, I didn't, don't have that in front of me now, but I'll try to include that screen capture that says the height of the wall to protect San Onofre from a tsunami. I'll throw that in here because it's, been, it's below the 46 feet. It's 30 feet if memory serves. Okay, and that's basically what I, I wanted to cover in this short video just to give you an idea that no, we are not uh, seismically ready and we're not uh, ready for a tsunami either if we have a big one like there was at Fukushima. Okay, thanks everyone for joining this uh, video. Patrick Penry, over and out.